we want to cover some things about Alaska. There are many things you can do. Um, obviously, Alaska is a huge destination, so there are many places you can go. No chance you can do it all at once. I wouldn't suggest that. I would suggest pick one, and it's close enough. Go back for another time if you want to do something else. Uh, you can see, compared to the rest of the United States, it is very large. So we're going to talk about what you can do and the best time to do it. Here are some possible destinations, one of the places we've been. You can go to Fairbanks or further north to do some uh, northern lights photography, and Beth's going to talk more about that. You can go even farther north and get to um, polar bears and Denali, of course, the highest mountain up there. Beautiful when you can see it. <laughs> in, in the southern part, um, you can go to places like Homer or the uh, Kodiak Islands where Katmai is and see some bears. We'll, we'll show, talk about that. Also, the inside passage, the southern part. This is southern part down here, obviously the inside passage. And if you want to cruise, very smooth down there. Mark and I were just talking about that because it's so protected by all the islands. Nothing to worry about if you're otherwise think you don't want to be on a moving ship. Um, Homer and Seward are down on this little spit and the Kodiak Islands are here, so that's a good jumping off point to get to those islands. Denali is, is here. And now keep in mind that picture of the United States just from Anchorage to here doesn't look like much, but it is. And Fairbanks, Northern Lights, polar bears up there. When to go kind of depends on your destination. The reason you want to go to Fairbanks or Northern Lights early in the year is because you can't have, remember, we get so much light in the summer. Well, north part of the earth is darkest then in the winter and the lights show more. Uh, I believe they're year round, right? You just can't see them. There's solar Correct. flares all the time. You just can't see them when it's too much light. So you go in the winter. It's going to be cold, but it's worth it. And in March, that's the highest uh, percentage of clear nights. So if that's the focus of your trip, that's a good time to go because you have to have clear nights. If you want to go f all the way up north for the polar bears, usually that's in the fall. Denali, most of the last three are summertime things, but you can you know, go a little later to the southern part of Alaska into September if you want to. Most of the others I would do um, May through August or so. Well, if you're going to go, what, uh, you need certain equipment, and sometimes, depending on your destination, you need different things. So tell us about the Northern Lights equipment. Um, well, obviously, you want to be shooting on a tripod. You're going to want a um, wide-angle prime or a wide-angle zoom, um, a cable release. You also want to have a red light uh, because you're going to be um, looking at your um, camera and you don't want your eyes to adjust with a white light. So your eyes don't, your pupils don't open up as much with a, a red light. Plus it's not as intrusive to others. Um, the other thing you want to be sure and, and have related to equipment is to really know your camera because you're working in the dark and um, you, especially if you have other people around, they won't appreciate you having your red light or flashlight on. It's very disruptive to their shooting, and so you need to really understand your, your camera so you can make those adjustments. The other thing that I really recommend is to get some really, really good gloves, hand warmers, because if your fingers are numb, you can't do much of anything. <laughs> so. Plus, it's, it's not fun. super pleasant. <laughs> yeah. so. If you're going to shoot bears, you're going to want uh, longer lenses typically, but don't leave your short ones at home. Uh, I think we'll see pictures where uh, you can get extremely close to the bears. Now, it depends on where you go also. In um, the most popular place that you can go to, I think it's in Katmai, and there are platforms where the photographers have to stand and you're looking at the waterfalls and the river where they are catching salmon. I went to a different place and it was mostly wide open landscapes. We were able to walk every, anywhere and they were able to come right up to us and they were sometimes within seven or eight feet of us. 
you don't want to have your 100 to 400 on when they're, when they're up that close. So take a combination of lenses is what I would suggest. And if you have a teleconverter, include that in case they're only at a distance or something good is happening at a distance. And of course, for landscapes of any kind in any of these locations, you're going to want a, I would choose a wide angle and maybe a medium zoom lens. There's not much you need a long telephoto for. We'll see in Denali there are animals. You know, if you have a long telephoto and you're going to Denali, then you can maybe take a long telephoto. But you want to talk more about the taking pictures? Sure. So, um, you know, when you're looking at planning um, a trip to specifically for the Northern Lights, um, we went to Fairbanks and to um, Chenna Springs, which is about uh, an hour and change um, kind of northeast of Fairbanks. And the reason we chose that is um, it's dark there. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's in the Aurora Oval. So if you see the lower left-hand photograph, you can see where the Aurora Zone is there in that green. And so not that you can't see the Aurora in other parts of Alaska and Canada and many other places, but it's going to be strongest in that oval. So if you're going to Alaska to see that, uh, to see the Northern Lights, that's a, a great place to, to, to find some place in that oval. Um, you also want to consider the moon cycle. So a lot of people, you know, like moons in their Northern Lights shots. I think it uh, can add some interest, but it also is going to add some challenge related to exposure. So um, just to kind of think about that, where you're at in your moon cycle. So we planned our trip where it was no moon so that we could have total darkness. We didn't have to worry about the moon. Um, so that's, that's something to look at. So one thing that's really interesting, I think, in, in planning, especially for the Northern Lights, there's all kinds of apps and webcams that are helpful in planning. Um, I have Aurora Now and My Aurora Forecast. This will allow you to look at the um, predictions. Um, you know, there's, there's solar disruptions and flares that are going off that cause all that magnetic energy, which causes a lot more color, a lot more um, power in the, the Aurora. So these apps are a lot of fun. I know that, you know, there's some webcams that you can watch, like, I would used to wake up the next morning and um, you can play the whole night in about two minutes. So you can see what happened and when. So it just kind of allowed you to get a sense of what usually happens um, as you're looking forward to your trip. So um, there's a lot of great planning laps and it's also really interesting to learn. Also, the Aurora strength is going to peak again about 2025. It's roughly an 11-year cycle, so you can see the, how it's kind of gone up and down. Um, so again, it's going to be stronger um, in 2025, and as, as we grow closer, closer to 2025, it's going to continue getting, getting stronger. This is a YouTube video. And this was taken the night we were up at Chenna Springs. And um, I did not do this. I, I think that some of my regrets of my trip is I didn't do more time lapse. I didn't do more alternative kind of photography because there's so much you can do. And it's overwhelming when it's happening. And it's hard to, you know, um, you have to kind of plan ahead, especially if you're going to do something like this. like a 360, you know, view of the, the night we had. Pretty impressive, huh? The whole thing. Sorry. Actually, let me ask Beth, <coughs> how much do you see to the naked eye? Um, that night, quite a bit. So looks, it looks like that video? 
Um, maybe just mute it a little bit more because hmm. I think the camera kind of saturates it a little bit, but um, you can certainly see it with your naked eye. Hmm. Absolutely. I think the camera does enhance the, the northern lights though. And how good are the predictions in those apps? Um, fairly good. Hmm. Fairly good. I mean, I'm not saying they're a hundred percent. Um, a lot of it depends on the weather too. You know, you can go out and the clouds come in and that's the end of that. So. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. We were there for um, photographing f for five, six days, six nights, and we had two phenomenal nights. So there's no guarantee. Um, that's why you want to stay there for, you know, more than just one night. Actually, let's look at some pictures of that first and you can talk about those. So this first picture is a picture that we took in Fairbanks when we got there to see these northern lights. So we went out um, by a cemetery and, um, you know, attempted to photograph, stood out there half the night. Um, and, you know, I mean, you can't see the northern lights very well. Was some of it because of the light pollution? Maybe. Horrible foregrounds. So again, it's important to plan and and find a place that it's dark and you have some some good foregrounds that you know aren't distracting like that. So this is a image uh, up at the top of Chenna Springs. There was a yurt there for us to warm up, and over to the left on the bottom you can see a snowcat. Um, but again, just beautiful colors. Um, the green is from you know the oxygen, and then some of the purples and blues are from nitrogen. Um, it depends um, where they're at in as far as altitude too, as far as what colors you get. Do they know how high they are? What's that? What's the exposure time? So I had most of these set at 10 seconds. Sometimes when it was really colorful, it would blow it out, so I'd have to decrease it. Um, I, it was always wide open at 2.8, and then um, uh, about 3,200 ISO. So if, if it was moving fast, I wanted to bring down my shutter so I could capture it. You know, otherwise you just get kind of a blur in the sky and it's just not near as impactful. But it's really, again, you have to know your camera because it's dark and that's the way you want it. Um, this is another one with the yurt. That you saw in that video, this was some of the color that you saw. So that, that's kind of the, the beautiful images that, that we got that night. Um, this is another one with some purples and greens. <clears throat> These are all just one exposure, right? So the Correct. foregrounds. Correct. Okay. Yep. Again, beautiful um, color. You know, I kind of, instead of including as much brightness in the snow, you know, you could even um, just kind of dark all that out and make a silhouette with the trees. I think that's just as effective. But um, again, you can see how that image has a much better foreground than the, the first one I showed you. This is called a corona. So this is literally, we were out there photographing, shooting, 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 and somebody would yell corona. And you know, you got your cameras on your tripods. And so you basically just crank it up and it's straight up. And that's when all the, the solar flares and all the magnetic energy is literally coming in through the, the um, opening in the oval. And so this is looking straight up and lots of different um, shapes and things that you can, like I think that looks like a horn, um, another corona. So you do that at the beginning of the night because you're not going to be doing adjustments. Um, you try and focus on a, sca a star and, you know, but again, it's dark and my eyes aren't so hot, so it, it is challenging. Typically you go all the way to infinity and maybe turn back a little bit, but um, again, you know, you, you, and then once you get it set, you want to tape it or you don't want to have to keep messing with it. You don't want to go out of focus. The other thing you don't want to do is bring it, bring your camera into a warm yurt. My husband did that and it was fogged up for about 45 minutes because of the condensation from the heat in the yurt. So you basically leave your camera sitting out there um, while you go warm up. Um, so this is my husband. Um, this is what we went up to the top of the mountain. Uh, this was called Char Charlie Dome, and you sit in this snow cat, and it takes about 30 minutes to get up to the top of this mountain where it's dark. Um, it's just a beautiful place to photograph the northern lights. Um, in addition, the um, 
uh, resort there had something called a Aurora ice bar. So everything is made out of ice. Very, very cool. Great to photograph. It's kind of dark. Um, but uh, again, we were able to go in with our tripods and um, photograph. This was a drink they served us. Um, they would, uh, it was called an apple teeny. So he, that's a, a, a glass made out of ice. Um, so, you know, there's other things to do there aside from the northern lights. And then this is, um, they have um, dog sledding, so that was a lot of fun. And there's also a hot springs there, um, so great to relax after being up all night photographing northern lights. Uh, inside passage. This is from a ship. Actually, I don't know another way to see it. You can hop around because these islands are not bridged, you know, the capital of the country you cannot get to unless you fly or take a boat. And they've found a way to do that. So most of the, most, I don't know, some huge percentage of the population, uh, which is mostly in the Inside Passage, own small planes, float planes, just to get around. But there, the neat thing about Alaska from a cruise standpoint is, even if you don't like cruises, I think it's one of the best destinations because there's beautiful things off both sides of the boat all the way, like this. So you're looking at this snow-capped mountains, no matter where you look. And sometimes you get, you know, really close. Um, sometimes they're far away. You get, you'll get these ice chunks, depending on where you are. When you get near a glacier, it's really nice. So another reason for a long lens here, um, perhaps if you want to zoom in on these mountains or glaciers. And another, you know, along the way, this is just foggy morning. Um, so if you get a veranda, an outside area you can go, it's great to just sit and, and watch as you're going from place to place. Yeah, and even this was probably June, <laughs> and there's still that much snow there. So uh, that, that makes it nice. There are small towns all over the place that they will stop at on the Inside Passage often look like this, built on the, the water. And this is Haynes, tiny, great little towns, and you, get, you can walk off and see things. Uh, one of the best parts, though, for me is seeing the glaciers, and especially if, they can, if they're going to calve, but it, you've got to try. Here's where, if you're going to do this, you might think about a smaller cruise ship than a bigger one because uh, a smaller one will get closer to it, and the closer you are, the more dramatic it is, and the smaller lens you need. Uh, because that ship, you can see how long it is, uh, is probably half a mile away or more from the front of that glacier, maybe more closer to a mile. Probably most ships will give you excursions where you can get in a kayak, too, or a canoe, and get right up to the glaciers, which is really cool and very nice. There's, this was something we found after we got off the canoe. Um, the ice gets deep blue. The more compressed it is under the weight of the ice above, the deeper blue it is. And you'll find stuff even way deeper blue than that. Uh, but you can just walk around and really <coughs> cool abstract shapes and colors for photographs. It's just an amazing thing. And then when they calve, Actually, the first time we ever heard, a, heard them calving, we thought a thunderstorm was coming because there's, it's just like cracks of thunder, uh, of lightning. And somewhere, and you might not see anything happen, but you'll hear it, and it's in the back somewhere. So it doesn't mean necessarily something's going to fall off that you can see. Then sometimes it does. This one kept, just kept falling apart. Uh, there was one, is this, I think this is a, video. Let's play this. These, these chunks are as big as buildings. This whole wall came down. This keeps coming. It's just really cool. And now to be honest, sorry, Yes, I did that. Um, to be honest, uh, I learned after 
a few times, the um, best way to capture that, to show someone else, is with a video. I have hundreds of pictures of these, of these calving, and you know, just holding the shutter down, and, and, the, and the ice just falls in steps. And you get home and look at it, and you know, each one is maybe okay, but you can't, it's hard to tell the motion, except for, you know, if you get a splash like that, you can tell something happened. But in, uh, you can't see it. I thought there was one of these. Yeah, you can't really. Sometimes you can't even see the chunks that are coming off in a static picture. Videos are great. So um, I would suggest taking both if you can. Uh, but anyway, there are other things like this. You'll see wildlife sometimes on icebergs. Uh, you can take excursions off the boat uh, up into the top of the glaciers and take dog sled rides. They'll let you drive the sled. These are the uh, Diderot dogs, and they keep them up there in the winter, uh, the summer, because they like the cold so much. And even though it's like 40, 50 degrees when we're there, that's almost too warm for them. Um, but so they keep them up as high as they can and as cool as they can, and it's real interesting to see that. Take helicopter ride uh, excursions, which are great for photography. Glaciers from the air are terrific, and that's how you get to the sled dogs, for instance. Here you go. All of that is a glacier, two glaciers coming together. It's it's really cool view that you can't see from up below um, when you go over these crevasses and the cracks in the glaciers. It, it's amazing. So lots of opportunities. There's also opportunities for whale watching. And there's some good whale watching um, down at, near Juneau and uh, <clears throat> some good companies. I put a, a company in the document I'm going to put on the web on the tutorial website tomorrow. There's a link to the company we use, which I would highly recommend. Uh, sounds really hokey. It's called Harv and Marv, but they've grown into quite a big business. <coughs> We've used them multiple times. They're very good. And it, this was a pod of killer whales that we came across. Feeding sometimes. Another reason for a, a longer lens, maybe. Sometimes the sea life takes over the man-made stuff. And you can get really, really close to these. But now Denali, this is, the, this is the mountain, also gorgeous, so majestic, so huge. But to be fair, they tell you the rule of thumb is it will only be visible, the top of it like this, 30% of the time. So you have a 30% chance of seeing the top. But it's still worth going, even if you don't. We, we got real lucky. Several of the days we were there, multiple times we saw it. And like this is the top of it too. So it is a beautiful range. The snow is always going to be there. But you can go through the park. Now, park only lets you drive in 15 miles in. And it's just really to get to a camping area if you want to camp there. There are plenty of lodges inside the park which you can use. Uh, and just outside the park, if you want to go and where you, you will want to stay there when you go. Then at the end of that part where the cars are, I can have to stop, there's a but big old school buses, and you have to get tickets on those, and they will do round trips. Four, six, and eight hours or something like that. You can get off and get the next one coming, unless of course you're on the last one. But uh, it's fairly inexpensive, but that's the only way you're going to see the park. And this is the kind of stuff you'll see, though. Strange, it looks like fall colors. This is June, probably. But we, we got fairly close to the animals. Reindeer. Even a fox. And the landscape changes a lot. This is also in, in the park. Mountains are all around us, but very different. So I'll Got up close to a bear. It's very beautiful. This guy actually came right up to the bus and we, we got out and he was just a few feet from us. I mentioned that going to Homer or Seward and this is what you see in Homer. Homer's surrounded on three sides by these mountains. It's a tiny little town. This is it. I think Bill and Marty stayed up in the top right here. But there are a few places you can stay, bed and breakfasts and stuff like that. 
uh, virtually nothing to see in the town other than animals, but even right in the town are eagles all over the place, hundreds. In a short drive, you'll need a car to get there, so you'll have a car, like 30 miles or something up the coast is another beach where there are also just hundreds of eagles, and they're so used to us, you can walk right up to them. And he'll be, he might be feeding on something on the, on the beach, and you can just walk right up to him. Very cool. So you have endless opportunities to shoot birds in flight, um, and a lot of birds sitting around. And there's a place called Bird Island. These, these two things covered by thousands of gannets and kitty wakes and that kind of thing. And you can uh, get it, an excursion. Uh, someone will take you out on the boat and circle this island and just take photographs of that. Or you can go across, the, they, they can then take you across the way to a national park where you can hike and there's beautiful waterfalls and things. But if you want to see bears, then there are many companies that start trips from Homer, and they'll use float planes like this. So you'll take off on a float plane, fly for an hour, hour and a half down to Katmai area, and then you can see these bears. You're walking with them. You'll get waders. The way we did it, we got waders and because a plane can't pull all the way up onto the beach, and you just walk to shore. Yeah, they'll give you all the safety instructions and you feel it's very safe. Bear, you stay in a group, basically, because bears will not attack something that's much bigger than they are. So as a group, with their bad eyesight, you're, you're okay. And I guess probably because they've been doing this long enough that they're kind of used to people. And, and the guides have been doing it for 20 or 30 years probably, and they know how to position themselves so they don't get between the mom and a cub that might be way off over there that you didn't notice. It all felt very safe. You, we spent about eight hours there each day and just followed them around. There's an idea of how close you can get. And he didn't seem to care. Um, they did this. This is where we got the closest. When they were on the sand, the tide was out, and they, they eat clams. They would walk around, and these razor clams, the weight of the bear would make a razor clam squirt water out of itself and it comes right up out of the sand. You wouldn't even know it's there because it's buried in the sand. So now they know there's a clam there and then they start digging. You can see he gets elbow deep and face down. It comes up with the face all sandy and muddy and, and those big claws just pried that clam apart like, like he had you know, a tool and, and ate it. It was really cool. Sometimes there's cubs. Nice background usually. Would have been better without the fog, but it was still good. And that's it. Any questions?